Good afternoon and welcome to Moments of Hope with yours truly Pastor Curtis Robert Grant and God bless you, Design Hope family. For those of you that are going to join with us, the conference call, you may dial 515-606-5380 and then the access code is 636-090. I hope uh, you have bought your Bibles. I hope by now you have been acclimated to the fact that when you come to sit uh, and to listen to any presentation that uh, I attempt to give, I hope that you have been acclimated to the fact that you need to bring your Bibles uh, because I want folks to be familiar and get familiar with the book so that we can learn that um, there is no substitute for it. Amen. You've got to be able to read it for yourself and because you make the effort uh, he that he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be fed and God has already provided for us a theater, which is actually the Holy Ghost. And so we ought to always be seeking the truth. And so what I am is a confirmer of what God has said. And I'm hoping by now <clears throat> we'll be able to make those uh, uh, connections and uh, understand what God really wants to do through us. I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 41. I'm going to read starting at verse 38 and ending at 30, um, I'm sorry, 43, and then we will discuss uh, what is and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some things that are relevant and will help us. So then Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And the house, I'm sorry, and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he, get, and he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they, call, and they cried before him, bow the knee, and he made him ride uh, ruler over all of the land of Egypt. And so I want to pause there, um, because it is, it is now uh, making reference to Joseph, and uh, I think that when you consider this particular presentation, uh, he wants to talk uh, about Pharaoh speaking to all of his servants. And I think the first thing that we need to grasp about this uh, situation that is in 38 
is that we all must understand how the Egyptians feel about the Hebrews, all right? Because at the end of the day, the Hebrews in the eyes of the Egyptians were an abomination, all right? They were, uh, according to their culture, the Hebrews were beneath the Egyptians. And so you have to already understand that coming into this relationship, there is a prejudice of cultures here. And because Joseph is in Egypt, he has to play by their rules. And because he's already been hated, all right, just because of who he is and his particular culture. And if you just pause for a moment, you can kind of understand how Joseph must feel being in a land of people who think they're superior than you. And you have to learn how to play by their rules, all right? And it seems like when you finally get an understanding of the game, then the people who is in charge of the games change the rules, all right? But I need you to understand the, 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 the intensity and the animosity that's already created with the fact that they were Egyptian and Joseph was Jewish or Hebrew. And so uh, Pharaoh looks at all of his servants, and this is what I'm trying to paint. And he says to his servants, who are all Egyptians, well, 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 well uh, most of them are Egyptians, can we find such a one as this man, uh, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? All right? And uh, I don't know if it was a rhetorical question because it doesn't record the response of the servants. But, but, but for, for, for Pharaoh to even make the statement amongst all of these Egyptians must say something about Joseph. And, and, and here is what I need to say because if it's about culture, they probably would have never dealt with Joseph. But because Joseph had such a godly disposition and a godly character that I think that his culture was not something that they would hold over his head because I think that his personality outweighed what they hated about him, okay? And most of us don't understand that when you operate in excellence or the Spirit of God, basically what he says here, when you operate in the Spirit of God, which is actually the Spirit of love, then whatever the person don't like about you, if your personality is so uh, 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 pleasing in God's sight and you are operating in the Spirit of God, that what they have against you will be minimized because what you have to offer will be so prevalent that they will not be able to hold you back by what they hate about you. And so when you look at Joseph, you got to understand that uh, uh, Joseph comes into this thing and, you know, he's just now coming into Pharaoh's presence, okay, because Pharaoh is the king. He's the king of Egypt and you can't come into his presence. You just can't walk up into his presence. You have to be brought into his presence. And so uh, when the king had the dream, they had to bring Joseph into the presence. And the point I'm trying to make right now is the fact that Pharaoh don't know Joseph personally. And so when you read the story, you find out that Pharaoh says to Joseph, and Pharaoh says unto Joseph 39, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Now pause there. Because the question is, what would make a man with so much power and so much to have and to and to, and to present that would turn around and give all he has to a person he's met only one time. And I'll tell you what I think really happened. Because Joseph's character has been so consistent 
that from the moment he got to Egypt, he presented the character of God. Even in the house of Potiphar, he rose because of his character. Even when he dealt with his wife, uh, he dealt with integrity. All right? When he got into the prison, he dealt with people with the love of God and from the prison, he rose up to be over the prisoners. And so, anytime you give this much authority and power to a man, you must have done your research. And the point I'm trying to make is this. If Joseph had not been consistent, he would have never been able to walk into his destiny because Pharaoh would have never trusted him. And the point I'm trying to get to you is this. You can't afford to not be consistent in your character because whereas you think that I can treat these people this way and I can treat people this, this way, you don't know who's connected to who. And when they get ready to do a resume on you and begin to get ask people about you, the very people you have thought to be nothing will be the very people that will have to open their mouth and speak on your behalf. And so the point I'm trying to get to you is this. We can't afford to flip-flop. We can't afford to be inconsistent in our character. We got to learn how to love all of them, everybody. Can you say everybody? We got to learn how to love them all. Crazy ones, the short ones, the me-90s, the P-90s, the T-90 ones. We got to learn how to love them all, y'all. Let me show you what the Bible says. Can I do this? Um, because when you talk about the character of Joseph, you talk about the love of God because the Bible says that God is love. So when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 4, watch what it says. We talk about gifting and character, right? It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that word charity renders in the Greek, it means love. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I missed that, okay, uh, so that I have all faith so that I can remove, uh, remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, charity, it profit me nothing. And so what I want you to see what, what he does here is, is he's trying to help us understand. He comes out of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, talking about the gifts. But he interrupts the giftings or talking about the gift with chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a parenthesis, a parenthesis between 12 and 14. And what Paul does here is he's trying to help folk understand you might be gifted. And gifted we will give to you. But your gift alone is not sufficient. Because with your gift you've got to have the presentation of God's character. And what he's saying is though, though I speak with the tongues, gifts of men, and have not God, charity, then I ain't nothing. All right? And so at the end of the day, y'all, it wants to speak to the consistency of your character simply because God is with you. And we can no longer afford, all right, to love this group of people and not love this group of people. To love this you know, color people, not love dark color people. And to and to be nice to these people because they got money. And don't treat treat the people who ain't got no money like they're in the grass. We can't afford to do that. Because when it comes to God's spirit, God is always consistent. And saints, might I submit that when you when you walk with God, you have to be consistent simply because God is consistent. Matter of fact, God is the only consistent thing in your entire life. All right? And if you're going to be consistent, you got to be rooted and grounded in the spirit of God and in his character so that you can have 
a consistent, can you say it, consistent character. And so when Pharaoh, uh, before Pharaoh begins to uh, put all of this authority in Joseph's hand, I'm almost sure that he inquired for Potiphar, because Potiphar was the keeper of the gods, all right? He inquired of the jail uh, guy, and he was in charge of all of the prisons. And then uh, here the baker, not the baker, but the butler, is the one that actually brought Joseph up. And so if you talk about Potiphar, if you talk about the jail keeper, and you talk about uh, the butler, what do you think those three men said that would cause Pharaoh to trust Joseph when this is the very first time he actually laid eyes on him? And I want to submit that it is the testimonies of people he's already trusted and proven that actually gives Joseph the open door for Pharaoh to trust him simply because the people he trusted trusted Joseph. And the only reason that they trusted Joseph is because Joseph distinguished himself different than everybody else they came in contact with. And saints, that's what I'm trying to help you understand and wrap your mind around. Because at the end of the day, your character needs to be consistent just like I try to work on my character. But some people just want to, some people just, just, just pull the ugly out of you. Okay? And that's what I've been help, trying to help people understand. We can't allow people to pull the ugly out of us. All right? Uh, Vanessa Bell used to sing a song, You Bring Out the Best in Me. Okay? I used to love that song. Uh, I wish I could sing, but uh, uh, you bring out the best in me always. And, oh, yeah. But anyway, and, 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 and she was saying that, you know, because of my relationship with God, every time I find myself in a tragedy or trial, I don't let the evil come out. I let the best of me come out. And when the best of me comes out, I'm at my best. And that's all I'm trying to tell you. We got to overcome that stuff. All right, and allow people to see the God in us. All right, and so uh, it's interesting now that um, uh, uh, this wants to help us see that our gifts are important. And let me tell you what First uh, Corinthians thirteen eight says. Here's what it says: It says charity or love never fails. And watch what it says. But where there be prophecies. They shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. And then he talks about uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things, okay? And uh, he wants to submit to you is this, that your gift will pass away, but will, what will not pass away is the love of God that is in your heart. Verse 13 says, and now abide in faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity, which is love. And so when it's all said and done, the only thing that's going to survive is the love of God that is in your heart, that's in your character. And so if everything else is temporal, the only thing that is consistent and permanent is the love that's in your heart and the love that you display to those people that you are encountered and the people you are around. Because at the end of the day, you don't know who's going to have to speak on your behalf. And so it's just best to love everybody. And I know we got some crazy folks out here. God knows I know we got them. We got some crazy folks we live with. But hey, God is trying to temper us to the place where we learn how to deal with every crazy spirit in a godly manner, 
where we can begin to even help them with their presentation and to introduce them to the God of our salvation. Because I believe that that's why God has left us here, is so that we can be witnesses to the world. And how many know that people don't want to know nothing you got to say until they know that you truly care about them? Okay? And so at the end of the day, that's where we got to start. We got to start loving the Lord thy God with all thy hearts on the mind and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Because until we can love people with an authentic love, people are not going to trust us or trust what come out of our mouths. And so at the end of the day, it all starts with this one thing called love. All right? And saints, that's, that's the best I have to offer to you. Because at the end of the day, when you look at us, we are just crazy, wide open. And what God is trying to teach us through this, 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 this servant, Joseph, is that you're going to go through many things. But the only reason you're going through is so that I can build your character, so that your character is consistent, so that when you get ready to walk into your destiny, even though you are hated by those who see you walk in your destiny, you have the character to overcome the hatred and the, and, the, and the animosity of you being the wrong culture or the wrong color or whatever you want to do. You have the power to overcome it and still maintain your posture and your gift simply because your character is a character that has been tested. I said uh, on uh, yesterday that a character that has not been tested can't be trusted. And I'm hoping somebody understand that. Because at the end of the day, every day God is testing our character. Putting evil in front of us to see how we're going to respond. And we got to start passing the test. Because vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. And I'm not going to preach out of death, but I'm hoping somebody got something out of it. Because saints, uh, we got to stop making excuses for uh, treating people any kind of way. All right? Because there is no excuse. Because you don't want nobody to treat you like that. And so you should not treat other folks like that. And so if you want to give your life to the Lord today, today is always a good day. You can inbox us your name and your phone number and our membership academy will get right back with you. So that we can try to get you into a good church where they can teach you about Jesus. And don't forget, at 1 o'clock every day we are in prayer. Family that prays together stays together. And God knows we need to stay together. And I'm still rejoicing off of what happened on yesterday. And I bless God. I mean, Sunday. I keep saying yesterday, but uh, Sunday. And I'm just grateful to God for uh, what he has done. And I'm looking forward uh, to doing it again. And I'm hoping we have more participants this time so we can turn the neighborhood out. We're going to show them how to party in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so we bless God for you. Thank you for being here. And I'm hoping something has helped you in this presentation. Let us talk to the Lord. Father, we love you. We ask now that you take this weak presentation, use it to your glory. Anything, oh God, that has not uh, been rooted and grounded in your word, uh, the wisdom that you share with us, uh, if it's not uh, something that is going to assist us and help us, God, I pray that you uproot it, that you be get the glory out of everything we do. Now, God, I pray that you would take these messages, speak to our hearts, touch our hearts and our minds in such a way that we might become the children you're calling for in these last and evil days, that people will see your glory when they come into our presence. And they'll be able to sample heaven simply because they came into the presence of one of your truly loving children. And saints, that's what God has called us to do, is to be a testimony to those that don't know. And so God, I pray that you help us to be that testimony consistently in our character and our love that you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen.